Romans chapter 12, we're going to begin reading with verse number 3. And I'm going to read that verse, and then we're going to uh, go from there down through verse 8, Lord willing, today. Verse 3, Romans 12, 3. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, that means every person, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Heavenly Father, help us today to extend our thoughts about presenting our bodies a living sacrifice unto God. You gave us these bodies, and you require us to do certain things with them. You've given us gifts, you've uh, given us opportunities, and you've uh, developed us through our lives. And we pray that we'll be able to honor you in giving our bodies in faithfulness to you. We ask forgiveness of the times that we've been lazy and backslidden. We ask you to return us to your fellowship and help us to, uh, to keep your commandments. Bless us now as we look through some more verses of this chapter. In Jesus' name, amen. In verse 3, Paul, of course he's an apostle, he's given the message, the point number one, a message from Paul the apostle. And he is an apostle. Uh, but he says this message that he's giving to this church at Rome, he said, it is through the grace given unto me. Now, we don't have to preach this over and over because we've known it for many years. And that is that everything we receive comes from God. And if it weren't for the grace of God, we would have nothing. Um, the grace that we have as believers is a grace that God bestowed upon us by giving us a new birth and birthing us into his kingdom and into his family, adopting us into his uh, family and uh, uh, translating us into his kingdom, as the Bible tells us. And it's all through grace. And Paul says, it's by his grace that I'm writing this letter to you. Isn't it wonderful to, to know that, and whenever you get something in the mail, uh, like a, a, either a gift or a, or a card of uh, thanksgiving or a card of, you know, wishing you well or blessings upon you, remember, that's God's grace. God gave that person the grace not only to write that, but the grace to feel in certain way to mail that thing to you. And so that's a grace of God. Now, this grace is a grace of apostleship, a position that God's given to Paul and a few others with authority to reveal God's word to these people. So whatever he writes in this letter is God's word, They're not just his arbitrary words that he wrote down, but it's God's word. And you know, it's an awesome thing. When, I, when I'm studying for a message, I'm trying to remember the fact that whatever God gives me, he gave it to me and not me myself. I'm sure there have been many sermons that I've preached that, that was more me than it was God. All I know is that if it's in the word of God, it's his word. And that's why I tried to preach what is in God's word and explain it the best that I can to get just God's word, not my words. But you know, it's so, uh, I don't know what you would say, not tempting necessarily, uh, but it's sort of natural, I guess, for the human being to take over and you say, oh, I have a good idea and I'll write this in my sermon. Well, that's not necessarily God's word. So it's not a light thing uh, to study the word of God and try to get what God is telling us. Uh, now, this message that he writes to them is to every man. That means to every person that is among you. And I believe that's the local church that's at, at Rome, or there may have been more than one church, may have been several churches there. Uh, but he's writing to local churches, no doubt in my mind. But it's to every person uh, that is in these churches. Uh, and that this, this word does not mean man as opposed to woman. This means man, meaning human beings. And so he's telling them that this is very important to every believer, especially to those that are in these churches. Uh, so Paul's message is to everyone. Now, bringing that over 2,000 years from Paul's day up to our day, it is for all of us. It's for you, and it is for me. These messages that he's writing is for us, uh, every one of us. Um, not specific people like just the preachers or just the deacons, 
or just this kind of a person. Uh, but a position, people in the churches had different positions. And he may have been talking, I know he was, to some of these people who are leaders in the churches. And he's telling us to not think of ourselves above what we ought. Now, there are certain people who are good preachers or other people who are good deacons or other people who are good at different things, which we'll talk about as we go along. But you know, in those churches, as well as some churches today, there are office robbers. You know, they try to get somebody else's position. Um, and I've seen that in some of the churches around. And those people are what Paul, to the Corinthians, called puffed up. You know what puffed up means? You know, you say, put out your chest. You know, oh, I'm puffed up. Or you blow a balloon up. I'd say, that'd be puffed up, wouldn't you? Yeah, some people get that way. I'm going to read this to you. I don't know if you want to try to get there. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 6, it says, In these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. That's a problem in a lot of churches. It probably has been a problem in every church there is at one time or another, that one person thinks he's better than another person, and one person would look down upon another person. And that's what Paul is saying that we should not do. So how should we think of ourselves? Well, in verse 3, it says we should think soberly. Now, when you think of thinking soberly, you think of not being drunk, right? Yeah, that's, what we, that's how we usually use the word, you know, to be sober is to be not drunk. Well, soberly means a little more than that. It means don't be crazy. It means don't think stupidly. It means think correctly. You know how I, the best way I know to think correctly or soberly is to read God's word and to think as God's word wants us to think. But he says, uh, don't, don't get overly uh, drunk in your mind. Not drunk with wine or, 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 or a strong drink. But this word means moderately or sensibly. Think sensibly. Don't think out of your bounds. And so I think it would be good to look at ourselves as God looks at us. Now, the best that we can, we don't know everything that God knows and understands about us, but... The best way I know, as I said, is to read the Word of God, and that's how God looks at you, as the Word of God looks at you. Each believer is given a measure of faith, and he gives you, he doesn't give us all the same measure of faith. He gives different people uh, different measures, which he'll bring out here in a little while. And he explains this in verse 4 and 5. Point number two, a message for the body, the church. Now, we've talked about present your body as a living sacrifice. Now we're going to present the body, the church, to the Lord. Look at verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, that would be your human body. And it also, as we apply it later on, it also belongs to the local church. We have many members in a church. Matthew 18, 20 says, For where two or three are gathered together, there am I in the midst. And that becomes one body. So there could be only two or three meeting together. And if they had did it scripturally and all, then it would be one body in Christ. The church is a body. And though it may have many members, it's still just one body. Each local church is a complete body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 27 says, Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. So each member of First Baptist Church is a member in particular. You're not just a member. You're a member in particular. You have a certain measure of faith that God has given you. And I think what he's telling us, you must use that measure of faith, all of it. Of course, we're all human. We all fall short of it. But whatever God has given you, that measure of faith, you use it for his honor and his glory. So each one of us is a member in particular. And uh, he says, and all members have not the same office. Every member can't be the pastor, and every member can't be a deacon. 
Every member can't be whatever other thing you might think of. The word office here means a function, a certain function in the church. Your body is the same way. Present your body as a living sacrifice unto the Lord. You use your hands, your arms, whatever member of your body, you use that for whatever that is meant for. You know, I uh, watch TV sometimes, and they come up on this commercial for St. Jude Children's Hospital, and they show these children on there that have one arm. They were born with one arm, with just one arm. Now, how in the world would a person be right-handed if he had only a left hand? See, you couldn't use it because it's not there. Uh, and so you can't use what you don't have. And a lot of the people in the body of Christ, of the church, they try to do things they can't do. They want, they want to elevate themselves to a position that they can't perform. Point number three. Gifts differing according to grace. Verse six. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. The gifts that are given to the church members, they all differ. We don't all have the same gift. So your gift, whatever it is that, uh, that God has given you, it'll be a gift that only you can do. People don't usually think about that. That's why in a lot of churches, only a few people carry on the work. And that's because other people think they're really not that important. It's really not important. As long as it gets done, somebody does it, who cares, you know? No, but there, there is a purpose and, a, and an office or a function for every member of the church. I don't mean by that that everybody uh, has a list of things that they're supposed to do. Maybe it's nothing but attending the Lord's house. Maybe it's loving your neighbor. Maybe it's greeting people. Maybe it's writing letters. It, it's a, there's a whole lot of different gifts that God can give us. But the first gift that's mentioned here is the gift of prophecy. If you have the gift of prophecy, notice the spelling is C-Y, then prophesy, that's S-Y. That's how you know the difference between those two words. Prophecy, what in the world? 1 Corinthians 14, 5. I think I've written that in the bulletin if you want to look it up later. He says, I would that you all spake with tongues. Wouldn't it be wonderful if everybody could speak in tongues? Now, you know, in those churches back in those days that there were different people who had different dialects and they were all in the same church. And so it would be one that would have the gift of prophecy, of prophecy and uh, they would get or a gift of tongues rather. And they would stand up and speak in the tongue that a certain portion of the, of the congregation could understand in that language. We would call it today interpretation. We'd call it interpreting. And that happens a lot uh, in other, other lands, and it happens here in the United States. For example, if we have, uh, uh, if we have a Spanish uh, church, they all speak Spanish, and they would ask me to come and speak to them. Well, no habla espanol here. That's it, you know. And a few other little choice words I could say that I, wouldn't matter much. But if I went there to speak, I would speak, only I'd speak a lot more slowly. And then someone who speaks that language would speak to them in their language and tell them what I said. At least I hope that's what they would do. That's, that's the faith you have to have in your uh, interpreter. Because if you don't trust that person, they might say the exact opposite of what you said. But he said, I would that you all speak in tongues. That'd be wonderful. God gave the gift to everybody. But rather that you prophesy, I would uh, prophesy. I would rather you prophesy. For greater is he that prophesied than he that speaketh in tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edification. If I get up here and speak to you in Portuguese, how is that going to encourage you? You'd probably get up and leave after about a minute and a half of it. You'd be, you'd be gone because it wouldn't mean anything to you. But if I have the gift of prophecy, what I'm doing is telling you in your language what God says. That's prophecy. 
This prophecy doesn't mean predicting the future. This prophecy just means preaching the word of God. So that's what I'm doing right now. I'm prophesying. I'm preaching the word of God. At least that's what I'm trying to do. God knows. So the main purpose of a local church is to transmit the words of the Bible so people can understand it. But if a person is to prophesy, he must do it according to the proportion of faith that God has given him. Sometimes preachers bring messages to the church out of pressure on them, on a certain subject or, or whatever, or out of uh, religious holidays or maybe uh, out of anger, maybe a certain person. I've heard of one guy talked about, said I was going to preach on this, and there was one person in the neighborhood that he had been trying to preach to, and uh, the guy had run him off all the time. Well, the guy came to church, and he sat down in the back seat, and he said, and I changed my sermon. Because I had a sermon right there just for him if he ever came to church. Now, see, that's what I'm talking about. That's not according to the measure of faith. That's according to your idiotic, stupid attitude. That's what that is. Now, let's go on and look at verse 7 now. Or ministry. Let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching. So he brings up two gifts here. Ministering. Now, you call... The, uh, the, the pastor, many people, they call me minister. Are you the minister at First Baptist Church? I'll say, yes, I'm the minister. Well, the word doesn't mean just the preacher. The word minister means to be a servant. And so someone calls me a minister, they call me a servant of the church. And that's exactly what I am. Even a Paul and the other apostles, Paul especially, he said, I am a bond slave, a servant of Jesus Christ. A bond slave. He, he wasn't arrogant. Hey, look at me. I'm an apostle. I've got this authority and I can do this. And, it, and the Corinth church, he said he had that authority, but he wasn't going to use it. He had the authority to, to demand that they do this and that, but he, he kept himself sober so that he wouldn't do that. So this ministering, it's also for everyone who has the gift of serving, serving one another, ministering to one another. And you know that's what we should do as members of First Baptist Church, serve one another, you know, give in to one another, um, help one another, encourage one another. But then there's another gift in that verse. And the third gift is that of teaching. The Greek word just simply means teaching. It's a it would be the same meaning in the Greek as it is in the English. But it takes skill and understanding to work as a teacher. It's easy for somebody to stand up in front of some people and say some words. I know I've done that. I remember one time, I've told you this before, if you remember. Of course, we don't remember much anymore. <laughs> uh, I was, we were in Algonac, Michigan. I'll never forget as long as I live. I was young. I was like 21 years old. And you know, 21 years old, you don't know anything. You think you do, but you don't. And so it came up to Sunday school time. We were having a tent meeting. Had this huge tent. A whole bunch of people came from down the neighborhood. And uh, how many of you remember the Ashton Avenue Baptist paper? I know some of you do. Any of you remember that? Well, you know, Brother Braun wrote that Sunday school lesson a week ahead of time. He would take the Southern Baptist lesson, which he thought that they had perverted, and he would rewrite it and send the papers to all these 110,000 a week. We sent out 110,000 papers a week. Uh, the largest church paper in the United States at one time. And so he would send bundles to these churches. And they would use it like a Sunday school book. And they got them a week ahead of time and they'd read through it. And the next Sunday they would go over that lesson and they'd refer to Brother Brown, whatever he said about it, so on. They'd talk about it. And so Brother Jones came to me. He handed me an Ashton Avenue Baptist paper. He said, here, you're going to teach the Sunday school class today. And I went blank. And I wasn't old enough to understand what Brother Braun was talking about. You don't know Brother Braun, but if you knew him, you'd know it takes a while to understand what he's talking about. Is that right, Juanita? I mean, he, I'm down here, he talks up here. 
So I'm thinking I've got seven minutes to get ready to teach this Sunday school class. So I got up and I hummed and hawed and read and, and almost sang a song, whatever I could do to get rid of the Sunday school period. And I have no idea what I said, Brother Likens. I have no idea. I don't remember a word that I said. And Brother Jones came to me after the service and he said, that was the worst Sunday school lesson I've ever heard anybody teach in my whole life. I said, thank you, sir. <laughs> and I started to say, it's your fault. Could you have done any better? And he probably couldn't have because it was on the spur of the moment. So teaching takes some time. So the teachers that you're under, that you listen to, they have spent some time. They've spent time in the Word of God. They've spent time studying, referring to some commentaries maybe, some history, some, you know, what's this all about? What's that all about? Where is this on the map, map and all that? So they can explain it to you. And uh, so there's a gift at that. Everybody can't teach, but teaching. That's a gift that God has given to different people, and it takes a skill to learn how to study for these things. Now, the main person in the church to teach is the pastor. And Paul writes a letter to a young preacher called Timothy. And you know what he says? I'm going to read three verses. I don't know if you want to try to follow me or not. I, hopefully I put them in the bulletin. 1 Timothy 1, 3, he said, I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia that thou mayest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. So Timothy was supposed to teach the teachers not to teach anything else except what Paul told them to teach. So he had a big job. He had to teach the teachers. Now that's what Brother Brong did at Ashen Avenue. On Wednesday night, he taught the Sunday school lesson for the next Sunday so the teachers would be prepared to teach that lesson for the next Sunday morning Sunday school. Isn't that a, a weird thing? He's up here, and we're down here. But you know, I learned a lot from Brother Braun. 1 Timothy 2.12 says, But I suffer not a woman to teach. What? I suffer, that means I don't allow a woman to teach. So Timothy, teach your teachers. They can't be women. Nor to use, usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. In other words, a woman is not to teach when a man is present. That's what that means. And that's what he said to Timothy, isn't it? So if you believe the Bible, you have to believe that. And we believe that here. Now sometimes it might slip through a little bit, but, you know. 1 Timothy 3, 2, a bishop, that's a pastor, then must be blameless. Boy, <laughs> I'm not very close to that. You know, Paul said, it's touching the law, blameless. Well, I don't know whether I'm blameless or not. As a bishop, it says, the husband of one wife, that is, you can't have three or four wives, vigilant, that means being watchful, sober, there's that word again, of good behavior, given to hospitality, and apt to teach. Apt to teach. Brother Berlin Heisel was apt to teach. You could not be with him more than ten minutes until he was teaching you something. And if he could, he would sit you down on a couch or a chair and he'd start asking you questions. What do you believe about the 144,000? Do you believe uh, that the Battle of Armageddon will be worldwide or just local? Or do you believe this or do you believe that? Or what do you believe about creationism? And, and he's not talking about the creation of the world. He's talking about something else. Or do you believe this or do you believe that? And you say, I don't know. And guess what he'd do? He'd start teaching. He was apt to teach. And uh, I hope I am to some degree. I wasn't quite as, as he was. Verse 8 now, quickly. We go on. Or he that exhorteth. There's another gift. On exhortation. If you have the gift of exhorting people, lifting people up, encouraging people, what should you be doing? Exhorting people, lifting them up, encouraging them. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. Now, the Bible warns about that. Jesus warned about that. Don't you give so people can see you give. One preacher was preaching on that this morning. And uh, 
he said, talked about people, and he said he had seen this. I've never seen it. But somebody would be given something in the plate and they'd wave it like this so people could see it before they laid it down. I've never seen that, but he said he has. I thought, well, that's pretty bad when you wave your money around showing everybody how much money uh, you're giving. But there's a gift of giving. But when you do it, do it in simplicity. It means just give your money and forget about it. It doesn't belong to you anymore. There are people who give money to church, and some of them give a whole lot of money to church, and because they do, they think that they're supposed to rule the church. Well, your money has nothing to do with ruling the church. If you're going to be like that, just keep your stupid money and be like the rest of us. Just be poor like the rest of us are and just go along. And so uh, this gift of exhortation, though, is like... Uh, a praise or a solace or a comfort. And uh, it's a very important gift. Hebrews 3.13 says, But exhort one another daily, every day, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened to the deceitfulness of sin. So maybe we should encourage each other. Now, the giving gift is the fifth one. And so all the members should be giving gifts. If you have the gift to do it. And I think the Lord has given to some degree or another uh, a gift of giving. And of course he tells us in uh, Hebrews chapter 7. It tells us to tithe to our Lord. We tithe to, we don't tithe to the church. We tithe to the Lord. Even in the Old Testament when they brought their money to the temple. They weren't tithing to the temple. They were tithing to the Lord. Now let's go on. The sixth gift is that of ruling. And it could be. Simply a stand, to stand before people, being able to speak or teach. And uh, if he's needed, which is a position that deacons do mostly, this ruling, some of it, but others can have the gift also. It's just a matter of serving. Just this ruling has to do with serving. And then... The seventh one is showing mercy. Showing mercy. What would we do without mercy? What would we do if we got justice for everything we did wrong? I mean, what if it were today an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth? Literally. We'd be in trouble, wouldn't we? Some of us wouldn't even be here. We'd be dead. Others would have black eyes or they'd be blind or they'd have one hand or whatever, you know. These are gifts that God has given us. In conclusion, Paul has laid down seven gifts that are given to church members to be used in their proper place by the, uh, to be blessed, to, to bless people and uh, to help one another. And the question is, what is your gift? The hardest thing in your life will be to find the gift or gifts that God has given you. And use them for the glory of the Lord, presenting your body a living sacrifice unto him. So we need to find those gifts and uh, use them in the church of the Lord Jesus. And God will bless us. He'll bless us as an individual. He'll bless us as a church. Uh, remember that verse we studied before in chapter 6, verse 13. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Sometimes we yield our members of our bodies to the world. We just let them have it. Okay, world, here's my body. Use it for your glory and your honor. And we should use our members of our body to make God's church harmonious and active. They're using our gifts in the church. Because in Ephesians 3.21, it says, And to him be glory in the church. By Christ Jesus, throughout all ages, world without end. And God will be glorified in his church. And that glory will last throughout all ages. So let's think soberly about our body and about the body, the church, that God may get the glory. And if God has touched you in any way today uh, uh, that you may need to do something or respond, you do that today and let God have control of your life. Let's stand together for prayer.